outside of fast time, which is awesome. Um, keep doing that, of course, until you get your sample box completed. Does everybody have your the handout at this point that they need? Okay, the spares. Um, this is for you, of course. There are old ones up here if you need them. These are brand new down here. Um, I said it last time, but I'll reiterate. The thing I find easiest with this is to just literally follow the directions and cross them off as you go. Like just put, not like putting a line through the whole thing because then you can't really reuse it. But in terms of the steps, as you've completed a step, cross it out. Um, make sense to everyone? And carefully read through the step before you like do the step. You know, if you skim it and then re read it after you've tried executing it, it's no es bueno. It's not a, it's not a great move on your part. Um, that's all right. It'll be all right. So Thursday, beginning of class. All right, excellent. Today we are going to be going over all of the hand tools that are going to be, well not all of them, but a sampling of all the hand tools that are, are available to you for your first assignment. Um, after, when I'm done going over all of this, we're going to break and then I'm going to introduce you to our first big assignment. Um, I'm going to show you physical examples of the kind of things that can be done with it. I'm going to also do a little slideshow, which I will post on Canvas later when I post the video. Um, for you to see examples of the kinds of things that you can do with Bandsaw Box. Very roughly, the assignment is to create a something, anything really, using Bandsaw Box construction that has an element of handwork in it. It's extremely broad so that you have the ability to kind of bring to it whatever you want, as it were, right? Um, so if you're a very functional person, you can make a box, that's great. If you're a little bit more sculptural, you can cut the thing apart and put it back together again so it has some sort of hollow space and then turn it into a sculpture if you wish. That's, that's perfectly fine. The, the goals for the assignment simply are to demonstrate understanding of this process and um, a familiarity with the hand tools that are available to you. Okay, questions so far? So what I'm gonna do today is take this box that we cut out last class. I'm gonna do a couple of little kind of refinement steps to it to get it to fit together better, which you all should see. And then I'm going to use it to uh, be the base on which to demonstrate this array of tools. Um, so this one's, you know, this went together pretty well. This, of course, I, I did last semester in terms of its initial construction and I just cut it out this semester. One of the things that it has though is a whole line of glue, tiny little glue beads that did bleed through. Even though I had, um, even though I had not put the glue all the way up to that transition, the glue still bleeds out. to leave that and let that dry. If, especially if the inside of my box was already treated in some way. If I had painted it, whatever. Um, in those situations, you're gonna wanna clean it out as fast as you can with water and like a toothbrush or a paintbrush, something to get in there and then you know clean up the mess as much as possible. But here, this is perfect for what we need. Um, at each one of your benches, there is a vice. It is this thing in the corner. Some of you have blue vices, some of you have black vices. All of the vices are quick release, which is amazing. For the black ones, it usually involves having the handle straight up and down. You'll hear it kind of engage 
um, which is really good for like being able to clamp something into it and without having to spin the handle endlessly. Right? Look at that. I work now. Here, I'll lay that down for you. I'll move that over for you. The work doesn't move. You should never be working on something with a sharp object and holding it in your hand. It's a recipe for injury. And even, let's say you don't hurt yourself. You're working way too hard. Like the amount of effort that it takes to hold something in one hand and work on it with the other and do it in a controlled fashion, it's twice the energy that you need to expend. So do it the smart way. Clamp it, make it unmovable. Oh my God. <laughs> and, then, and then work on it. It's, both, it's just so much safer and it's so much less exhausting. Oh my God. Anyway, so the black ones slide in and out like that. The blue ones are far more temperamental. Um, sorry, blue ones. They've got a latch on them. I'll demonstrate on one side and then on the other so that you guys can see. There's this latch right here. And you can push the latch in. And then pull. And that extends the vice out. You can wind and unwind with these. It just takes forever. So. against and it will feed. So don't worry, it's not broken. It's just contrary. So questions at all? Don't work on your sample boxes at all or anything if it's not clamped up. So you've got a couple options too for clamping here. Um, for those of you fortunate enough to have the black ones, um, you can either clamp between the jaws or you can raise this little nubbin right at the front, this is what's referred to as a bench dog. And you could actually clamp between the front surface of the table and the dog itself. See that? Oh. So if you want it elevated just a little bit, you can do that. Um, I'm ordering from Woodcraft later today a tool that's going to make it possible for me to put holes in the bench tops here four bench dogs for the blue ones because you can't clamp against this, um, the front edge, but you all have the dog in the front here. Well, we can put matching dogs in the tabletop so that you can still clamp to the tabletop. Um, most commercial benches have those already like prepped in them, uh, but because these aren't commercial benches, we don't have that. So anyway, we're retrofitting to make it more awesome for you. We're also going to be putting in, at the same time, power strips for everybody and task lighting. Oh, uh, what? Anyway, back to the glue. Questions at all so far? When you've got glue in little corners like this, you may say to yourself, but Sarah, how do I remove it? It's so in there and my fingernails are not long. Um, and I'll say, fret not, my children. You're going to use a chisel. You could, I suppose, use a knife if you wanted to, but knives, of course, require you to draw the blade back. With a chisel, you're pushing your blade straight down. It's a chopping motion. Let me, let me demonstrate. I'm gonna talk briefly about the chisel and then I'm gonna go back and talk about the hand tools just more generally from the most aggressive to the least aggressive. So 
chisels. Woodworking chisels typically are longer. Well, mostly that's it. They're longer <laughs> than uh, like Bucks Brothers bench chisels. In woodworking, there's sort of two terms that you're going to hear a lot about tools. One is bench tools and one is cabinet tools. So a bench chisel is the shitty chisel that you use to hack away at things that it doesn't matter if it gets glue on it. It's just, you know, whatever. Cabinet chisels are, it's actually not a reference to keeping it in the cabinet, but that it's the tools of a cabinet maker. Um, they are higher quality. You don't want to mess with them. <laughs> they usually have handles that are more for holding as opposed to striking. Um, things like that. That's what we have here. This is a cabinet chisel. So compared to the kind of thing you'd find at the hardware store, the blade is much longer. The handle is more svelte, as it were. Um, and it's made of a nicer steel or just generally kinder to it. Um, I would ask you to be very careful of my chisels. They don't make this anymore, which is, it's probably too complicated a story to go into, but um, let's just say that this was the standard for woodworkers everywhere for decades. Everybody had these chisels, every single person. Irwin bought marples, they made this chisel for a little while, and then they changed the design completely. And they're like, we're still selling the same chisel, and it's like, no, you're not. <laughs> so we can't get them anymore. It's very sad, and no one has come up with an adequate replacement. A couple of people have tried duplicating the handle style. It is just not the same. Anyway, I was looking for a chalk that wasn't green because it doesn't show up as well on the screen, but sorry. Chisels. Cabinet chisels and chisels in general are going to have a square edge across the front. They will have a flat back. This is all very important. The anatomy of a chisel. Actually, it's not the face, it's the front. Back, front, or top, depending on how you think about it. The back needs to be dead flat. Frequently when people are using it or when they are sh sharpening it, they start to roll this edge a little bit this way. This is bad news. In order for a chisel to actually be a good, accurate tool, the flat, the back of it has to be dead flat. That's not something you guys necessarily need to worry about doing, but it is something that you need to uh, know to look for. If for whatever reason your chisel isn't acting the way that you think it should, if it's not doing the job that it should, take a look. See if the, the end isn't overly rounded. Most of the time the edge is going to be slightly rounded, mostly because steel, while seemingly inert, has a lot of spring to it. And as I am flattening the back, which is referred to as lapping, incidentally, lapping the back, um, that front point, because it has so little mass behind it, can actually spring away. And it does, just a little bit. There's pretty much no, no avoiding it. But, you know, whatever, as long as, like, Almost immediately after that front edge, it flattens out again, you're golden. Um, from there, it has 90 degree sides that come up on it. That's another pretty typical thing you're gonna see. If for whatever reason the chisel doesn't have 90 degree sides, it, they're almost never wider than that, but they are sometimes um, angled back, it's usually because the, the chisel has been modified to do a specific job. Specifically, like if you're going to pair the shoulders on some dovetails where there's no clearance and you need it to be like, got to get in there, you got to grind that back. But from there, you've got bevels that come up. It almost looks faceted like a jewel. And then the bevel on the very front. The front bevel is, of course, the most important. It's going to be about mm, 25 degrees. 25 to 30 degrees off the, off the back. If it's too blunt or too sharp, it is going to break or not be very effective. Can I show you again? Yeah. yeah. See what I'm talking about? So what we're usually looking at is 
to make sure that this right here, right at the front, is square and shiny and lovely. Um, while it seems inadvisable, I will frequently touch it by like running my thumb up the blade, not down, to see if I can feel any burrs or, you know, inconsistencies. There's definitely a burr in the corner here. It's not that important at the moment because I'm just going to use it to clear out glue. Um, the other thing you'll take note of, or you should take note of, is inside view. Because of the way that we sharpen this, this front bevel here is actually going to be curved. If you really, really like look closely at it, you'll see that it's curved. That's referred to as a hollow grind. Um, so instead of being a flat plane, what it's doing is it's actually reflecting the profile of the grinding stone, the sharpening stone that's on there. This is a good thing. Hollow grinding your chisels is, is fabulous. Because what it does is two things. It makes it easier to sharpen. Think about it. If I were to put this on a stone now, the, well, the process of, of sharpening a chisel is you go through many, many steps. Usually it involves shaping it on the wheel and then refining that surface on progressively finer grits, just like you're polishing something. Oh my goodness, that's what you're doing. But when you do that, because you've got that hollow grind here, it's going to touch here and it's going to touch here. And that goes so much faster in terms of sharpening as opposed to trying to refine that entire surface. Do you guys remember when you were milling your boards the other day? How much easier it was to go like that first pass? Because it was barely touching. It was touching on one side and then on the other. Right? And then as, as you kept going and it got flatter and flatter, it required more work. So it has that benefit. The other benefit is that this bevel serves to kind of break the chip that you're raising. Any debris that comes into here is just going to be like break off and be clear and all that good stuff. Questions? So how do we use it? How does it work? I'm going to be really on you guys' case about how you're holding your tools. Just, you know, fair, fair warning. <laughs> As a right-handed person, I hold the handle with my right hand, but I always hold the blade with my left. I never use a hand tool one-handed. Or if I do, it's my left hand and not my right. If I'm using my tool one-handed, it's because I'm using another tool as a striking kind of accent. You have to have your hands in opposition. If both hands are facing the same direction, if you slip, you're really gonna like go the distance, as it were, and potentially, you know, damage your project, damage the table, whatever. If you are like this, one hand is controlling while the other hand is pushing, and you're gonna get really, really nice results for what you're doing. I will occasionally sometimes, you know, get it going like this, but it's always left hand is controlling the blade, right hand, or dominant and non-dominant as the case may be right hand is exerting the pressure to get it to do what I want it to. So what does that look like? In this case, the flat back of this chisel is the most important part for me because what I'm trying to do, here's the inside of my box, right? There's the side and there's the bottom. And here's my bead of glue, right in the corner, right? What I want to do is cut that out. And I want to do it as cleanly as possible. So what, I'll, what I will be doing is using the flat back as a reference and sliding it down the side. Makes perfect sense, right? Slide it down the side, try to pop it out. You know, so that chisel is going to get it in there. Just like that. Straight down. And then the other nice thing about that bevel is if I need to, I can flip my chisel over and ride it along the bevel to come at come at it from the other direction. Hey, let me just demonstrate that at this point so that you can see what I'm talking about. Here's my chisel. If I'm trying to clear something out that's on a pretty broadly flat surface, I'm going to try to use the widest chisel that I can. In this case, I grabbed a three quarter. We do have them up to one inch, but they're in need of some love. Um, one of these days, I'm just going to do a, like a 
chisel maintenance day. Um, but it looks like this. And I'm first I'm going to turn this around. Because this side will be easier to demonstrate with. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my chisel and I'm going to press the flat side of the you know, of its back here against the wall. I'm actually kind of pinching it, you see that? So that it keeps reference. What I'm trying to avoid is twisting because then I'm gonna get a lot of damage marks in the bottom there. And all I do is I press straight down. Oh, look at that, straight down. Nice and gentle or not depending. If I feel like my um, chisel is drifting at all, I can kind of start by leaning back a little bit and then, or leaning forward and then working the chisel into that crack. Fascinating, I know. But I do it along the length with both hands on my tools. And do you see how I'm standing? Unfortunately, you're gonna stand like this a lot. Um, I barely know how to straighten up anything. My poor lower back, dear God. Um, but the thing that I'm not doing right now is sitting. You can't woodwork sitting down. It's very sad, but, but true. Um, you need to be able to change your body positioning so that the tools are being best used, most safely used, most controlled usage. And you just can't do that if you have to reposition your chair every two seconds. So. So what's happening now, I'm going to turn the work. Don't be afraid to turn the work. If you can't turn your body, turn the work. That's the beauty of the quick release. But look, now I'm going to come in here and I've got the bevel on the, the bottom now instead of on the top and I'm going to just slide it along. And it works kind of like a hand plane then, which you're going to see in just a minute too. You can hear it, it kind of clicks when it breaks free. It's better to do this when the glue is not as dry as this. This is super, super cured up. It's, um, it has no flexibility anymore. So when it breaks off, it tends to take some of the little fibers with it. And that's just sad. You, you can, but the whole point of doing this is to not have to do that in the first place. Frankly, trying to sand the inside of something, especially a corner, is so difficult. It's just going to yield really crack results. Um, you can see where I missed now. There are a couple spots. I'll make it fast. Come on, you. The things that I would like you to not do, though, are use your chisel as a pry bar. Please don't do that. Um, you can use it as a scraper, that's okay. Um, but don't get in there and twist or lever. You're gonna break the end and I'm going to be very upset with you. All right. So it ain't perfect, but it ain't bad. make your flange a little bit smaller, right? Make your flange a little smaller so it actually fits. That does not always happen. Regardless of our intentions, sometimes the flange just doesn't fit. Um, you might also recall my saying that, uh, ooh, yeah, that the thicker you make the flange, the harder it's going to be to fit because there's just so much more like material there that you're having to contend with. In this case, it partly doesn't fit because there's a little bit of glue, but it also partly doesn't fit just because it's, it's pretty close. It's just, meh, whatever. So how do you go about fitting a lid like this? The answer is pretty straightforward. Um, you're going to want to turn, and I mentioned this before, you're gonna to wanna to turn the, the flange into something key-shaped. So here's your lid, and here, 
Here is the flange glued to it. Start by removing any glue from the corners, which is just going to be a repeat of what I just did. And then using your chisels, you're going to taper the sides like this so that it's still large at the top there, but it's not at the bottom. And I drew that pretty dramatically. That's probably a more exaggerated bevel than I'm really planning on putting on there. Um, and I'm going to work up to it as well. It sucks when you take too much material away and then something rattles around. Um, so be, you know, be a little conservative in how much you're removing. Like I said, I'm going to start by taking the glue away, just so I know that that's not the cause of whatever my issue is. Sorry. And I can do that without too much difficulty. Once I do that, I'm just going to keep fitting it. So that it is slightly better already. It was binding on the low glue bits. It's still not great. And remember too, if I'm going to put glue on this for whatever reason, or glue on it, paint, sorry. If I'm going to put paint on it or any kind of finish, that's going to build this surface up too. And it's going to not fit again. So if there's a little rattle in there, Sometimes that's not such a terrible thing because you're going to be able to make it fit again just when you put your, your finish on it. Now I've got a little bit of glue on the end grain here. It shouldn't probably matter that much, but... All right. But anyway, here's how we do it. I just look for my grain direction. In this case, I'm going to want to be cutting this way on my side here. And I am just going to start at the top and bevel this ever so slightly. I'm keeping it above the surface of the lid itself so that I don't damage it. So again, if this is that lid, here's that flange, I am starting by taking off that. If I've got my chisel closer to the lid itself, the likelihood of my digging into it is very high. So, And you can also see at this point I have flipped over my chisel so that the bevel itself is riding on the back side here. The reason I'm doing that is because it makes it easier for me to get the angle that I need to feed it through. Um, so I have not removed much at all, frankly. but I'm still going to test fit. Test fit after every pass. Yeah. Flip it over, repeat. Typically, if you flip it end to end like that, the grain is running diagonally through something. So once you determine the angle that you should be, or the direction you should be approaching from, it's going to be the same. So I'm able on this side to come through. Do that same thing. And what I'm doing is I'm resting the chisel on the edge and then lifting it like this. Can you guys see that? Let's try that again. I'm resting it on the edge of the lid of the box and then lifting it so that it's cutting the flange and not the lid. <laughs> one of these days I'll have one of those overhead cams like cooking shows. Edit the whole thing together. Production values would be amazing. I got hired by Netflix. That's pretty good. It's still not perfect, but that's all the time I'm going to take to do it. Um, at this point, it does close completely. And while it doesn't open without some effort, it's not too difficult either. Cool? Questions? All right. Anybody need a break at this point before we really get into tools? You need a break? Okay, take it. So Kirsten asked the question, am I just rounding those corners? Um, and the answer was no. Um, I'm starting by kind of taking the material off the corners, but if it's 
you know, if that still doesn't fit, what I'm trying to do is eventually kind of work that plane of bevel down so that it meets the very top. It's just that I don't want to take too much right off the bat because then, remember in wood, it's a hell of a lot easier to take material away than it is to put it back on, especially if you don't have a flat surface. So uh, I'm just being cautious. I'm slowly but surely working that kind of plane of bevel down onto onto the flange. Make sense? Everybody can kind of picture that? Okay. Um, so let's talk about hand tools. We have an entire array of hand tools for you to play with. Um, I am going to show them to you kind of from most aggressive material removal to least aggressive material removal. Um, and frankly, as you're working, that is how you should be working. You shouldn't be dicking around with something that's not gonna move material quickly if you have a lot of material to move. Just because you're like comfortable with a file doesn't mean <laughs> that you should use it to shape your entire project. There's all sorts of things at your disposal here. So let's talk about them. Um, at the very top of the uh, aggressiveness chart, we have the draw knife. You should all write this down, because I'm going to write it down in a second, too. Maybe even, you know, draw yourself a little diagram of it, so that you know what I'm talking about. The draw knife gets its name, very naturally, from the fact that it is drawn towards you, typically, as you are working with it. Um, draw knives are, are particularly good for stripping bark from trees. Oftentimes, that's what they're being used for, as opposed to some degree of shaping or other you know, material manipulation. We have two in the tool room. We've got this one, which has a straight blade that's more or less in plane with its handles. And we have this smaller, more deadly curved guy whose handles are very cranky and like to rotate and, and be removed. I have replaced them several times, and this is kind of where we are at it. Um, but the idea is that you hold the handles and you draw the knife back towards yourself. So here's another important note about having both hands on the tools. If you have both hands on your tools, it's a hell of a lot harder to injure yourself. If I have one hand on something and it's slipping, I can eventually, depending on what's happening, you know, move it in opposition to some other part of my body. If I've got both hands on it and I slip, most of the time, stabbing yourself is really difficult to do because your body wants to stop it naturally. Um, same thing with the chisel. If you're actually holding the chisel where you should be, which we'll get to when I get back to it, stabbing yourself with it is very difficult because there's only a little bit of the blade sticking out. If I'm not holding it where I should be, it can be much, much easier to damage yourself. So remember that. How does it work? Well, it works by putting both hands on it, finding an angle where it's going to engage your board, and I, as I said, drawing it towards yourself. You can, I'll, I'll make sure that you see everything, don't worry. So I'm being very um, non-aggressive at the moment. I'm going to flip this around so I can be a little more aggressive. I'm going to try to do this from both planes so that everybody can see what's up. This is another reason why you might want to leave extra material on your walls and things as well. It's because shaping is fun and you sometimes really get going with a tool and, <laughs> and then all of a sudden your wall is an eighth of an inch thick and you're like, oh no, what have I done? And, I say, and I'll say, you played yourself. Um, but you can see how if you really catch a heavy cast right at the front, you can really move a lot of material. I'm being very gentle with it right now, but you can go whole hog and really move a lot of material like this. Um, so I'm going to set these back here. Let's see how this guy does. This one 
has a little less finesse. But it also ha doesn't have the offset handles, so it's just, I don't know. Like I would use this one to strip bark. I would use that one to shape a, a piece of wood. All right, draw a knife. So we've got that out of the way. Um, similar to the draw knife, but much more refined is this little dude here. This is a spoke shave. Can anybody guess what spoke shaves are used for? It's right there in the name. What's a spoke shave for? It's for shaving spokes. Come on. <laughs> spoke shaves are used to create the spokes of wheels. You know? It, it has a similar anatomy to the draw knife in that it has handles on either side and then a blade right in the middle. In this case, the blade is adjustable and it can, is in relation to kind of a bed or mouth as the case may be. Right? But they were used and are used to make long, thin pieces of wood round so, so as to become spokes. We have many different spoke shapes. This one happens to have a curved face on it, which allows you to kind of work in, in irregular areas. Um, see if I can get this one to really do its job. But what it's really good for is rounding over the corner of something. Because, hey, that's how you make spokes. Think about it. You start, if you're going to make a spoke, you're going to start with a long square piece of wood. This is it in, in end view. And you're going to essentially keep faceting the damn thing until it's round. You have enough facets on it, it becomes a circle. It's pretty straightforward. The thing that it doesn't want to do is really broad, flat areas. Hear that? Ooh, that was an unhappy noise. It is fabulous for radiuses, radii. Make sense? Yeah, you'll see old illustrations of German wheelwrights or wingwrights um, using a special kind of carving bench called a schnitzelbank, where you'd like stick a piece of wood in and clamp it down with your foot and then just, it's rad. All right, draw uh, spoke shape. Any, any questions about the spoke shape? So this aggressively removes material. Um, not as aggressively, actually, as a couple of the things I'm going to show you next, but it's so closely related to the draw knife in terms of its anatomy, I wanted to kind of do it at the same time. You'll also notice, incidentally, as I am putting all the tools, as I'm manipulating the tools, that I'm making sure that my cutting surfaces are not touching the table. I have my pan planes on their side, for example. See that? I have the chisels on their backs. That is to help keep the blade from getting damaged, dulling it for whatever reason. It's really easy to accidentally set something very fine down on a piece of dried glue and, and chip, believe it or not, chip the, the, the sharp edge of that tool. So don't be surprised if as you're working, I come around and I'm constantly like flipping your tools over, changing them so of the way that they're facing you. Another thing that you might take note of here too is that I have all of my cutting edges with the ex exception of the um, draw knives because I have them handles towards me. Um, I have them so that the, the sharp side is facing away. It's extremely easy to accidentally reach for something and stick your hand right into a cutting tool. And if they're sharp enough, you can cut yourself without even thinking. I cannot tell you how many times I've done that with my carving tools. 
because carving tools are especially sharp. And I just reach for something and I nick myself. It's like, are you freaking kidding me right now? But anyway, hand planes. Hand planes should be stored on their sides while you are not using them so that you don't muck up the, the blade. The most aggressive one we have here is this guy. This is a scrub plane. Scrub planes are used usually when you're milling your boards by hand. This guy does the initial hogging off of extra material that enables you to flatten it. So, most aggressive, scrub. The scrub plane, this is the only um, like wooden sole plane that we have here as well. And if you take a look, the blade itself is curved. What it's going to leave behind is kind of this scalloped tool mark, um, which can be really, really bad. So if you're ever thinking to yourself, Claire, hey, which one's the scrub plane? It's the wooden one. Most every other tool in there is labeled scrub plane for whatever reason is not. So I'll rectify that at some point, hopefully this semester. But when you're using a scrub plane, you are not working with the grain. Believe it or not, you are scrubbing either across it or diagonal to it. And it just, it's how it works. I realize that sounds like a bad explanation, but I assure you it's not. I'll show you this in just a second. So if I have a wildly uneven board, or especially one with a cup in it, right, and I need to work that high area off, by quite a bit. This is the front, this is the back. Just like, oh, what does this remind you of, this action right here? Does it remind you of pushing something over the joiner? Well, that's because the joiner is a giant mechanized hand plane, essentially. In feed bed, blade, out feed bed. What? See how that works? Anyway, looks like this. So I'm working diagonally across the grain right now. Anytime you've got a, a hand tool like this, um, actually any tool really, at right here where the blade intersects with the bed, it's referred to as the mouth. Don't let the mouth of your tools get super clogged up. Um, I'll come around with this in a second so you guys can see it. The nice thing about the scrub plane is that it leaves behind this really beautiful texture. Um, you can actually use that as a, as a finished texture to your surface, no problem. Because the blade does extend as far out as it does too, um, you can do a fair bit of shaping with it. Obviously if you're using it to flatten the board, that's a lot of material removal that you're trying to do there. So it should, I can work directly across. Like I said, typically, in terms of milling a board, it's going to be a combination of alternating between diagonal and straight across, and the sum of those cuts is what gives it, gives it its flatness. the throat. If you get the throats clogged on these, you have to take the entire tool apart. And then that means putting the whole thing back together and recalibrating it to cut. And it sucks. Um, it's an excellent learning experience. <laughs> like, you're like, great, now I know how to put my hand plane back together. I'll show you with this, because there's a low spot that's not getting cut. So you'll be able to see kind of the difference between the surface that the bandsaw is leaving versus, you see, see those bevels, versus the surface that this one leaves. Isn't that pretty? It's also kind of like shiny and, 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 and dark.
surface treatment with this, and uh, like with applying layers of different kinds of paint and then very lightly sanding over it. Of course, I got a splinter when I did that, of course. But anyway, scrub plane. Any questions? All right. The plane that probably gets used the most, um, though, is going to be this guy right here. This is a block plane. It is definitely not more aggressive, but I'm going to call it the most important. This is one of those tools that like is essential for every woodworker. Every woodworker, their basic toolkit when they first really get going is gonna be block plane, combo square, chisel set, you know, maybe a couple other things, but this very definitely. The nice thing about the block plane is the length of its sole, S-O-L-E. It's very, it's very short. It is, this one is a one-handed tool, believe it or not, or it can be. Um, it's got an adjustable mouth that opens and closes, so it's got this little knob on the top here. I can loosen the brass knob and then move the steel lever beneath it back and forth to open and close the mouth. There you go. So, yeah. This one is actually pretty filthy at the moment and should probably be taken apart and tuned up. So. <coughs> this to chamfer my edges, which we haven't really talked about yet. I will very briefly touch on it. Um, you'll notice that rule number three of woodworking is always chamfer your edges. We're going to talk about that more when we talk about sanding, but chamfering an edge means putting the world's smallest bevel or curve on something so that you don't cut your hands on it. Your wood, when it comes off of the tools, is going to have a very harsh transition and you can actually give yourself like a paper cut with it because it's so sharp. A chamfer is just this little angle that goes on something that keeps you from hurting yourself, essentially, right? So, say so I'm gonna shape this other side here. Chamfer edges. The block plane should be used kind of diagonally to yourself like this. You don't really want the, the length of the whole sole to be in reference. You want it to be maneuverable. So, oops, sorry. See how I'm getting these nice little fine things off of it? Um, but if I want to do some shaping, I can. I'm just taking... I'm holding it diagonal, but I'm pushing it with the grain. That's the thing. The scrub plane, I was holding it di diagonal, but I was moving it. I was holding it kind of diagonal and, and scrubbing diagonal to the grain as well, if that makes any sense. Check the tape. You'll see what I mean. Um, let's say I wanted... I want to refine this lid. I can do that fairly easily and produce the world's most funsies little shavings here. I would recommend that you play with all of these, um, either with your sample box, though you're not required to, or with those pieces of wood that you created on checkout. There's a reason why I typically have you guys save all of that. 
And you can see the broader and flatter I hold it, the wider the shaving I get, and the more material I can move. Um, right here, this is a, a very useful demonstration right here. I caught the grain in the wrong direction. The grain changes direction right here, and I have to tear up. See it? And it is ugly. So in those situations, the best thing to do, believe it or not, is to cut across the grain. Instead of trying to find something that's with the grain, it's to be, it's to cut directly across. Does that make sense? And then unfortunately, probably stands the ever loving crap out of it. Right there. Compared to the other thing. But the black plane is fun, 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 fun. It has lots of parts though, and that's sort of the thing. Um, I, mean, I am going to move the computer slightly closer so that there's some detail. It, it obscures your vision. Um, you guys can come a little closer, like, and still maintain social distancing. Just do your best. We're working, we want the six feet, actually. And now I've started the video again. Okay, so. With the block plane, there are the various parts here. This little dude on top is the cap. And if you move the lever from one side to the other, it loosens or tightens the cap. I can remove the cap, under which there is my blade. Here it is. And then the frog. That's this little adjustment right here. The only reason I bring this up is because you probably will have to take this apart and clean it out as you're working. It's just what, what is. Um, when you put a block plane back together again, you're gonna set it on the edge of the table so that the mouth is hanging off the front. Put the blade back on the sole so that one of these little holes right here is lined up with the nub that's on the frog. Um, if you are at all concerned about whatever direction the bevel is supposed to be in, remember, you should be able to read the brand. Toolmakers are proud. They want you to know that it's their tool. So if this Stanley ends up on the bottom, you know it's, on the, it's facing the wrong way. I should be able to read it, okay? So I decide which nub to rest it on based on how far out it's sticking. For the most part, I should have it probably in that middle slot. And then I just kind of line the whole thing up. From there, I put my cap back on. Push it all the way down so that it snaps under the screw. And then turn the lever to tighten it. Loose, tight. This will all be on that video very, very well described. So if you have secondary questions about it, you can do that. So now my blade is sticking out, right? And I want to adjust that to be, you know, a little more controlled. In order to adjust that blade feed, that's this, oops, sorry, sorry. It's the knob on the back here. Usually what I'll do is I'll loosen that cap a little bit just to make it easier for my blade to go in or out. And I'll set it on something so that I'm able to feel how much the blade is, is protruding. And frankly, I don't want it to protrude too much. Again, always better to take not enough than too much. Because I can just, I can keep feeding it forward much more easily than I can put the wood back. So I feel like I've got it pretty good. The mouth isn't open too much. It might be a little bit of an aggressive bite, but I'm about to find out. So I'll put my lid back on. There we go. Let's see what it does. Got it completely tightened up. Oh yeah, that's a heavy bite. It's a good one. But if I were to not want to tear out really badly right here, I would probably retract it a little bit further even. Um, do not be afraid to take apart your hand planes. It's okay. Please don't take apart the scrub plane, the metal ones. 
The scrub plane is a real pain in the butt. <laughs> the metal ones, on the other hand, are, are different. Um, but yes, familiarize yourself with your block plane, especially, because this is, this is an essential tool. Okay? I brought out two more hand planes for you to, to see. Um, one is what's usually referred to as a jack plane. All of the different plane names have to do with their functions. To be fair, I am not sure what the special designation is about jack plane. Typically, it's not very wide across the sole. Um, I like it if I'm trying to do something where I need a greater length of reference. I can pivot this way without a whole lot of difficulty because it's not that wide, but I can establish flat because of the length of the sole this way. Does that make sense? I would think so. It's much like the joiner in that regard. So, ooh, nice. One thing about using a hand plane too is that as you're going through, just like with the joiner, your pressure should shift. But in this case, it should shift in the, in the reverse. As I'm starting, I have a little bit of pressure on the front and I shift it so that most of my pressure is on the back, on the back side of the cut here. So, not taking away very much, that's for sure. So it's not simply a matter of just pushing forward in this, in this case. You want to get the blade to engage, and gravity is not working with you as much as it would be with the, hand, with the joiner. Ooh, that is leaving behind a nice cut. You will get a nice workout when you're doing your handwork. You know, you're gonna break a sweat. You're gonna have forearms like a beast. It's amazing. Other than the jack plane, um, I brought I brought a joiner out as well, just so you can see the range. And that's what this bad boy is. This is a joiner plane. I feel like I'm holding it like an AR-15. You know, it's so huge. And I mean, you can guess what it's for because of the length of its sole. It's for smoothing and flattening big boards, essentially joining them. What? Just like with the joiner. So it, it's, this one will be used as part of the milling process right towards the end there to make sure that everything is staying flat. I don't even have the blade fully extended on this one, so I can't demonstrate it at the moment. Oh, and I forgot to show you the parts of this guy, because this has its own set of anatomy. Um, this one has a cap. I'm for, I, I know I'm forgetting my terms here. When I remember them, I'll update them. But there's a, a, like a pressure cap on top here, lever. You loosen the lever there, which lets you, again, take the cap off. This is, of course, the sole again. And then um, with this blade setup, there's actually two parts that are screwed together. And if you look, there's this shorter top part that's curved, and then below that is the blade. Um, the little dude on top is what's called a chip breaker. The idea is that when you're taking material away, the chip breaker does exactly that. It breaks the chip and it makes it so that the, the plane doesn't clog very quickly. It's typically situated very close to the front of the blade. Um, no more really than a sixteenth away. If it is farther away than that, it's not doing its job. And again, I can see the Stanley at the top of the blade there. So I know which direction to go in. And they're screwed together. But same thing when you're setting up your, your plane. If this gets completely clogged with material, this is the frog in this case. Um, I set it up so that my blade isn't going to touch anything here. Feed it through. And then in this case, and actually on the other one as well, but there's a directional guide. I can change the angle of the blade by moving this lever back and forth. This one right here. And there is an equivalent 
um, like back lever on the block plane. You'll find it very quickly. Um, but anyway, I start by setting everything up straight because then I can adjust it from there. Come on, baby. I've got it upside down. That would explain a whole lot. <laughs> nice job, Martin. I was like, well, will this fit? Well, anyway, put my cap on, tighten it down, and then from there I can feed the blade forward and backwards with this wheel. That's what this little dude in the back here is for. So again, I'm going to actually retract my blade a little. So I feel like it's sticking out a little too far. And then I can square it to the sole with the lever in the back. So everybody's, um, you know, handling of the tool is going to be a little different. So it, much like with the bandsaw where you have to make an adjustment every time, frequently you guys will have to make an adjustment based on how you're using it. Um, either feed the blade out a little bit more, change the angle that you're hitting it at, whatever. Um, just to see, I'll feed it back down a little bit. There we go. There, nice. <coughs> the point is that's expected. The other thing too with hand planes is that they take practice. They take practice. Don't expect to do a good job with them immediately, but work through it, get the feel for it. You'll get it, I promise. All right, from there, I have other cutting tools. Um, and these are, of course, my chisels and my gouges. A chisel or a gouge, frank, frankly, the carving gouges are typically, or are actually considered to be a form of chisel because they are a tool with a single handle, an extended shank, and then a cutting surface right at the end, right? other like large material removal. I am, let's see, hi. I use them alongside a round mallet like this. Um, there's two different kinds of mallets that are typically found in woodworking. Um, actually there's three, but we're gonna talk about two. One is the dead blow mallet that I keep in the uh, tool room, sorry, in the glue room, in the cabinets that it says mallets. Those are the kinds that you use, they look like a hammer. You use them to smack things into submission. That's why we have them in the glue room is because if you've got something that needs adjusting while you're trying to glue it, hey, pull out a dead blow mallet, smack the crap out of it, get it to be where it needs to be. A perfectly round mallet like this is for carving. It is for holding in your hand, smacking something, and using the force of the mallet to move the material as opposed to just forcing it with your upper body strength. Um, the reason that we use uh, round ones like this is so that you're never, you just can't miss, if that makes any sense. This one has a fair bit of glue on it, which I'm not too happy about, but regardless. We have two of these. These are from the Wood is Good Company. It is a polyurethane headed mallet. This one, I believe, weighs 20, yeah, 20 ounces, um, and it's fantastic. You can, the other nice thing about it is you can pick it up and you've always picked it up in the right orientation. That's really what it means, is I don't have to think about what surface is facing forward. It's always correct, right? Um, so what I said before about, about holding the chisels here, right? I said you're gonna have one hand on the blade and the other hand on the handle. That is especially true, well, half of that is especially true when you're doing your carving. Your left hand or your non-dominant hand should be on the blade. And it should be far enough forward, like I said, that I'm not going to be able to stab myself easily with it. I'm not holding it like this. I'm holding it on the blade, frequently with my thumb right at that transition. If you've got a longer hand than I do, well, then that thumb is probably gonna be somewhere else, but it helps to serve as a pivot point. 
But the nice thing is I can set my hand with the palm right up on my surface here. Everybody see this? Yes? I can engage the tool so that it's touching the material. And then I can give it a little tap. If I'm doing this, it looks very dramatic. I have no control. If it slips, I can stab myself right in the leg. Let me try it again. I get it set where I want it to be. See that? So I have really, really good control here. In this case, what I'm doing is a series of cuts, V cuts, where I'm cutting in one direction with my grain. You can see how it wants to kind of break off here. But then after that, I'm going to come back and I'm going to cut the other direction, and that chip is going to completely fly out of there. And I'm going to be left with a nice decorative surface. This is the direction the wood wants to break. This is a good thing. You'll know really quickly if you're going the wrong direction because it's not, it's either going to want to tear really badly or it's going to want to take your chisel further and further and further into the cut. If that happens, do not try to lever your way out. Pull straight back. If you try to lever your way out, again, you're going to damage your tools. So I went ahead and I did one in one direction. I'm going to flip this around so I don't have to do this in an awkward fashion. And now I'm going to set my wrist again. And I'm going to go opposite. And I didn't go quite all the way. I am going towards myself, but in this case, do you see there's like, I'm not going to be able to stab myself because so little of the blade is sticking out. See if I can't get this going a little bit better. There. Every time I do this demonstration, my Fitbit's like, are we working? It's like, no, we're carving. No, but we're working. It thinks it's being tapped to tell me something. It's like, no. Turn that back around. See how I keep flipping over my chisel when I set it down? I am not setting it down on its sharp side. In this case, what I'm doing though is I'm going back and forth to get a clean cut. The chisel is good for a facet. If what I'm doing is trying to achieve something with flat surfaces where everything meets really cleanly, a chisel is a great tool for that. I can also do a lot of convex curves with this because again, I'm removing little bevels of material and that eventually yields something round. Um, you'll notice too, I don't have to use the chisel, or sorry, the mallet. I can use the mallet because it makes some things easier, but when it gets to the point where I want to refine things, typically I'm just doing it by hand. Perfect. In fact, it's hardly even pretty, but it works. So, if I kept going and the pour was more careful, this would look a lot nicer. But the fact of the matter is, it still demonstrates my point. Alright. One of the other things that I'll typically is I will sweep as I go. I don't want to stand in this all the time. The more you are standing on irregular surfaces, the more your back gets hurt. This is just irregular enough that it's starting to get annoying. Um, so I'll probably sweep it up in a second. But so that's chisels as a shaping tool. Um, and remember too that your chisels come in a variety of widths. So just play with them, see what they do. Uh,
We also have these amazing carving gouges. We have just such a huge, huge selection of carving gouges. I can, like, it's hard to describe. Most of the ones that we have are made by a company called Swiss Made. Technically, the company is called File, P-F-E-I-L, um, but they're usually called Swiss Made because that's what's stamped on the handle. Um, any of the ones that actually belong to the university are going to be labeled MSU Wood. If you happen to find a carving tool, and I mentioned this last time, if you find any tool at all that has a tiny little square, either burned or engraved into it, that is my personal tool and should be brought back to me on a pillow. Like, I found this, your majesty, your goldfishiness, you left it somewhere. <laughs> I'll be like, oh, great. <laughs> anyway, the thing to know about these is that um, they're labeled with a, a numerical system. And it looks like this one, for example, is labeled a 9 10. Or Right? That, this is a 9 slash 10. This one here is an 8 slash 16. This weird ass thing is a 1s 16. This extremely weird V shaped one is a 13 10. And this one, this beauty, is a 3F12. So what does that mean? Um, the two numbers and letters stand for specific things. The first, well actually, let's talk about the second one here. 10, 16, 16, 10, 12. I think I also brought out, I did, an 8, 7. The latter number is the width of the tool in millimeters. And that is also how I have them organized in the drawers. Don't, do not, hang on.